Regardless of where you are in life, you need to plan for the future. And for most Americans, that involves planning for retirement. The task can feel overwhelming at times and easily pushed aside for later. But a well-constructed plan for the future not only helps ensure a secure retirement, it can also be a powerful engine for savings and wealth generation. For today's episode, I've invited my colleague, Mike Conrath, U.S. Head of Retirement Insights at J.P. Morgan Asset Management to help guide us through the toolkit for retirement planning and the key strategies that individuals can leverage. And let's get started. Michael, welcome to Insights Now. Thanks. I'm thrilled to be here, David. So uh, can you tell me a little, for, for starters, a little bit about uh, your team, uh, Retirement Insights, and, and wh why are we interested in educating people about retirement? Sure. Well, I'll tell you a little bit about what we do and why we do it. So I'll start with did you know? Yes. So did you know that the typical person spends more time planning a vacation than they do planning for retirement? I can believe it. Pretty wild, right? You can believe it. Yeah. I mean, the planner in me doesn't really get it, but the person, the human does. At retirement planning, it feels overwhelming. It can feel daunting. It involves a lot of decisions. There's sometimes math involved. There's also a lot of emotions. So that's why we do what we do. So we're trying to help advisors and the families they serve stay grounded in the key principles that can lead to retirement readiness. So to do that, we do two things. We do research around some of those big planning ideas, and two, we deliver them in a way that we think simplifies the complex, mm -hmm. and that's where our guide to retirement comes mm -hmm. in. And again, the goal at the end of the day is to help investors make more informed decisions about their retirement. Yeah, and, and so obviously it's, it's a lot more than just planning your 401k. I mean, what, sure. what conversations should investors and advisors be having here? Yeah, well, I, it's a great question because I think that's where the conversation often starts and stops for most mm -hmm. individuals, is with the 401k. And that's certainly a very powerful vehicle that if you have it available to you, you have to be looking at that, or IRAs, traditional Roth flavors of those things. That's important, but retirement planning is a lot bigger than that, and it's more broad. And I tend to look at it through the lens of managing risks. And there's a number of risks you face as you're planning or approaching retirement. Certainly, there's the markets, and we could talk about what a sound investment strategy might look mm -hmm. like there. But it's also the difference between being a saver and an investor. And I think those are two different things. The terms get used interchange interchangeably, but I think they're different. And cash looks really attractive right now. Mm -hmm. But over the medium and long term, will it be that attractive? Probably not. So it's important to get invested and stay invested. So that's one area of risk. Mm -hmm. The other lens I look at in terms of risks is longevity risk. So the good news is we are living longer as a society. So we've come a long way over the past few decades. But with that, the retirement calculus changes a bit because now if you're living longer, that means you generally need to plan for an income stream over a long period of time, and it becomes just that much more complicated here. So you need to factor that in. And as you live longer, the other risk is healthcare. Yep. So you're living longer, but you're more likely to experience some type of catastrophic healthcare issue. And I, I kind of think of this as the, the known unknown. You know you're gonna have some type of healthcare issue at some point in the future, yep. You just don't know when it's coming, what it is, and to what extent it will impact you. So my guidance is you need to look at all these things holistically, not just at the vehicles, but all these things in terms of risks, but also opportunities. Yeah, so, so it's really, it's about, well, first of all, I, you know, I couldn't agree with you more on the whole issue of savings and investing, because I think people don't, don't realize the difference. You know, we, sure. we're just actually, uh, this week, we're, we're, we're putting out our new long-term capital market assumptions, and you know, in the long run, we think that cash might give you 2.9%, I think is our long-term forecast, and we think a balanced portfolio might give you 7%. And you right. sort of say, well, you know, 7%, 2.9%, what difference does that make? But in the long run, it make, make all the difference in the world. Absolutely. Because you, you compound it. I think right. you know, that, uh, one of the things you and I know for many, many years in, in financial markets is just the power of compounding. So it really does make a difference. There is a huge difference in the outcome between somebody who's just a saver and somebody who's an investor. That's right. And, and then, you know, and then the, other, the other problem, as you say, you know, if you're so lucky as to live so long and you, and you don't get your money to grow, you may not get your money to last, particularly if, if you get, you know, if you have... And I say everybody's going to have something in their health sure. eventually. Unfortunately, sure. that's that's life. Yeah, not to be daunting, but I'm an optimist. But you have to plan for these things. Well, yeah. And so, what what gets in the way of people saving enough for retirement? I mean, when you talk about a, a retirement plan, what do people have to do in order to actually achieve 
what, what they're supposed to achieve here? Sure. I, I think, well, outside of the typical things like limited bandwidth, inertia, all those things, and that's where an advisor could certainly help individuals stay grounded and focused, but it is having a plan for starters. Having a plan that includes all those risks we were just talking about a few mm -hmm. minutes ago, David. And also, I think it's important to recognize for younger indiv individuals, the calculus also changes a little bit. Generally speaking, younger workers don't have the safety net or a backstop, to, uh, like a pension, mm -hmm. or DB plan, like older individuals might be more likely to have as part of their overall retirement planning strategy or income stream. And you know, I kind of think of this so at the risk of using a sports analogy and alienating mm -hmm. a big part of our audience, perhaps I think of the NFL, since we're in football yeah. season, we came off football Sunday. And in 2015, there was a big rule change. And I won't put you on the spot, ask you what it is, but basically they moved the line of scrimmage for the extra point back 13 mm -hmm. yards. And it, at the time, it didn't seem like that big a deal because after a touchdown, Special teams comes in to kick the extra point. That's the point. You get up off the chair yeah. or the couch, you grab a beverage or a snack, because it's, yeah. it's a guarantee. The, yeah. the kicker is going to make it. Well, it's a bit different now. On any given Sunday, it's not uncommon to see that kicker miss, right? Yeah. The ball goes left to right, askew of the goalpost. And that's how I think of a lot of the, the younger workers today. The likelihood of success it's somewhat similar it's you know it's still a good chance of being successful and reaching the goal or getting through the goal post but the younger worker has to kick the ball an additional 13 yards to achieve the same outcome yeah so what can they do and i think that's where saving early and saving often so that's an old adage mm -hmm. in our industry but it has held true over the years so for example where we see this actually setting into the minds and the actions of workers is if they make a contribution to their 401k plan, make sure they're not leaving the match on the table. So if the company is offering a match, that is- Free money. Free money. And as much as we can say guaranteed, that is almost a guarantee. At least on that day, I know I'm going to get a return on that investment, yeah. whatever that company is offering. So don't leave money on the table there. The other thing is, even if you start with modest amounts, so in our guide to retirement, we talk about a worker putting away 3% of their income starting at age 25. Let's assume they make $50,000 mm -hmm. a year. Well, by the time they reach age 65, so 40 years, hypothetical 6% straight line annual rate of return, that investment that they're putting away, that 3%, actually adds up to about $880,000. Pretty significant. Again, modest contributions adding up to large dollars. Now. Let's say that individual said, okay, I'm going to start with the three, but I'm getting raises every year, and I'm going to make contributions that are commensurate with my raises. And let's just say it's a modest 1% increase in my 401k. So they start with 3%, they increase their contributions 1% a year, up until they reach a cap of 10%. Instead of hitting that 880000 they hit about $2 million. Mm -hmm. So again, small contributions or modest contributions can have really meaningful results over the long term. Back to that concept of compounding we're talking about. And, and one of the things that you and I were talking about earlier, is, which is perhaps overlooked, is it's not just a matter about having, of having a retirement plan. You've actually got to have a financial plan in general, because one of the biggest problems you run into is you don't have any backstop if you run into trouble. So the first right. thing you do is you raise your 401k, and then, yes. then you've got a problem. Sure. Yeah, and your 401k should not be viewed as a piggy bank. Mm -hmm. You know, that's hands off. Unless you need to, to make that decision based on whatever personal circumstances you have. But we're seeing some interesting data come out of the, the Chase households yeah. that we look at. So our team has access to data. It's completely anonymized, by the way, completely anonymized. So it's all reported in aggregate. But we see spending mm -hmm. starting to tick up. And I know you talk about... Yeah. Never underestimate the power of the consumer. Oh, yes. And uh, I think of one consumer, actually, who's very close to me. She's 12 years old, and she happens to live in my house, and she's my daughter. Mm -hmm. And I know that if I give her $20 to go to the mall, she will find a way to spend $25. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, smart girl, but I, I think that's somewhat telling. Um, so what we see in the Chase household data is that 9 out of 10 households are spending to such a level, or we see what we call spending spikes, yep. meaning that nine out of 10 of them cannot cover their spending on a monthly basis from their income. 
and about two thirds of them can't cover their spending out of their income or their cash reserves. Mm -hmm. So back to what you're saying about rating your 401k, so what happens next? They tend to turn, pan the camera to their 401k in terms of loans, that we see them looking at credit cards, or they actually decrease their contribution rates. So spending is an important thing to consider. And back to your point about, it's not just about retirement, it's about overall financial wellness and health. Yeah, and I think that's particularly important now. I mean, one of the things that we're seeing after the pandemic is that a lot of people had actually uh, achieved a certain standard of living during the pandemic because of you know, various government aid and, sure. and, and so forth, and perhaps the thing that they were doing was highly compensated. And now they're in a tougher environment after the pandemic, and they're That's not right. getting that money, but they're trying to maintain that standard of living. And I, I mean, I think you, you talk about it as spending. I, I, I Perhaps I look at it a slightly more optimistic way and saying, look, your spending is too high given your income. So you can either cut your spending or you can increase your income, but you've got to look at it honestly. So find For some sure. way of doing one of those two things, because what you don't want to do, as you say, is, is uh, you know, look at your retirement plan as the first place you, you raid, because you, you'll never put the money back. And then, exactly. and then, you, and then you've got a, a, a real problem. Would you say, you know, I mean, obviously, there's a big income divide here. I mean, upper income individuals presumably find it easier to save for retirement. But do, do you think that it's practical for the average person to put together a robust retirement plan these days? I, I think it is. And again, I, I think starting where or answering that with where we started, David, just in terms of it feeling daunting, overwhelming, you don't have to solve for all of these things at once. Again, that's where focusing first on what is offered in the workplace, mm -hmm. back to the concept of taking full advantage of a match, if I have that mm -hmm. available to me, starting small, giving myself an increase in contributions over time. Focus on those things. And it comes down to really control. Control the things you can control. Mm -hmm. We can't control what markets do. We can't control what happens in the political landscape, geopolitics, what's happening in the world. Why we have to be mindful of some of those things. We can't control them. Mm -hmm. We can control our savings, and I include the investing mm -hmm. in this <laughs> sentence in that, but we also control our spending as well. So mm -hmm. focus on what you can control and then expand from there. Yep, exactly. So it's you know, making sure you're doing saving, but also investing the yes. money that you saved and all, and you know, don't spend too much, or if you are, if you find your cannot cut back your spending, figure out a way to get your income to rise. But right. either way, have a plan. Yes. Because, because it's, and, you know, I think that that's true in many aspects of life. That that you may not be perfect in achieving your plan, but you've got to look at that plan and and, and hold yourself accountable to it. Um, have there been any changes recently, either in what employers are doing or various government programs or, or, or rules which which are sort of changing the the retirement landscape? Oh, absolutely. I'd say for this year, probably one of the biggest things, if not the biggest thing in terms of legislative or regulatory activity, is the passage of Secure 2.0. Mm -hmm. So this was passed December 29th of 2022. So. 92 provisions in that. Do we have time for all 92? No, 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 no probably but, not. But give us okay. the highlights. Yeah. I think the quick highlights, I would say a few things. One is that for small businesses, there are incentives to start workplace retirement plans. And I think of, when I think of small businesses, I think of my parents mm -hmm. and primarily my dad. He was a small business owner and he was tough as nails. He was focused on revenue coming in through the front door, trying to manage expenses leaving through the back door. Mm -hmm. And if we were to sit here, or he were to listen to a podcast today, or yeah. and say, you need to be starting a workplace plan for your employees. The first thing he would say, when he leans back in the chair and kind of looks at this How sternly. How much is this going to cost me? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Have you met him? No, but I, <laughs> He's Irish. I, can, I can picture him. Okay. <laughs> okay. So <laughs> what's it going to cost me? And that would be a legitimate question to ask. Mm -hmm. So enter Secure 2.0. That question, essentially, or that hurdle or barrier to entry yeah. goes away because, in short, there is a tax credit which can cover startup costs up to $5,000 mm -hmm. for small businesses. So up to 50% of startup costs if you have 100 or fewer employees, or if you're in a smaller business like my dad had, 50 or fewer employees, 100% tax credit against your startup costs up to 5 k mm -hmm. a year for up to three years. So that hurdle to getting started goes away. Just some other quick things in Secure 2.0. RMDs, so required minimum distributions. You know, for years, that age was 70 and a half in our industry. Mm -hmm. Then Secure 1.0 went up to 72. This year, into Secure 2.0, it's 73. However, for younger individuals, it extends out as far as age 75. Okay. So that creates some planning opportunities. If you're not forced to take distributions until a later age, mm -hmm. 
therein you're not forced to pay taxes on yeah. those distributions. There's an opportunity to think about that, looking at it through the tax lens as well. And we see some advisors talking to their clients now about doing Roth conversions mm -hmm. or thinking about doing a partial conversion so they can, they can convert that pre-tax and soon to be taxable income to tax-free income. Because if they're not forced to take RMDs and increase their taxable income, there might be a window of time now or into the future to do the conversion prior to taking RMDs. Mm -hmm. So there's some planning opportunities there. And you know, the last thing in Secure 2.0 relates to portability of 529 plan accounts. Mm -hmm. So there's a provision that will allow 529s to be transferred into a Roth IRA on behalf of the beneficiary on that account, mm -hmm. which I think is really cool. And that goes into effect in 2024. And now there's a few caveats to that. It's not the entire account necessarily. There is a $35,000 lifetime limit on that account. Mm -hmm. And there's also a few question marks that are still out there. What happens if you had changed the beneficiary on the account? Does that reset the clock? And we're still waiting for further guidance on that, but it just creates more flexibility. And I think all in all, it, it points to the importance of retirement on the overall legislative front. Uh, yeah, well, and it, it does sound like the government's trying to do something to make employer-sponsored retirement plans more attractive to the employer and the employee. And I, I think sure. that, you know, in a world where Honestly, the labor market is very tight, and it's very hard to get good employees and hold on to good employees. Having that sort of tax incentive to provide that benefit is is is, is uh, you know very significant. Absolutely, it's certainly attractive to the worker. So, so finally, and this has been fascinating, but what would you say are the biggest myths and misconceptions about retirement planning? Sure, I would say the first thing is that you need a large pool of money to actually get mm -hmm. started with your planning, and I think we've debunked that already. I think one of the other big areas of mystique or mystery is around Social Security. And I think this is an opportunity for advisors to add value in their client conversations because there are benefits and trade-offs to claiming your benefit at certain ages. So in short, there's three ages to keep in mind, 62, 67, and 70. So think of those 62 being the earliest you can claim Social Security. Think of 67 for most individuals, younger individuals being your full retirement age at which you're eligible for 100% of your monthly benefit, or 70, extending it out. Mm -hmm. Now, there's benefits and trade-offs, as I mentioned. If you claim Social Security early, there's about a 30% haircut yeah. in your monthly benefit. As opposed to waiting, push it out to age 70, there's about a 24% premium mm -hmm. in your monthly benefit. Now, this doesn't mean, David, that everyone should wait until age 70. Again, I think this is where you have to take a step back and look holistically at longevity, as we talked about, you know, family history, but also other sources of income. If I can wait and I do expect to live a long life, maybe it's in my benefit to wait till age 70. And that's why, that's why I think it's so important, actually, to start into retirement planning early. I hate to think that, you know, at 70, I'm going to be sort of s struggling through the paperwork to try and figure out which of these I want to do. I, I'd admit, really much rather do it now and figure sure. out, you know, have an understanding and working with, and also work with a financial advisor who can help me Absolutely. with, with, with uh, making these, de these decisions. Um, so, Mike, uh, this, is, this has been fascinating. I, you know, I think it, it really underscores the importance of retirement planning and, you know, I've got lots of running analogies whereby, you know, people, you, you don't have to run marathons to start, you know, to, just uh, plan for a little 5 k is, is right. good. But, you, but the main thing is hold yourself accountable. Have a, have a plan. Absolutely. Figure out how you're going to do it. So, so this, this is, uh, you know, I think it's, it's, it's great advice. Sure. And individualize that plan. Well, uh, absolutely. And, that's, and, and you know, every, just like every individual potential runner is, is, is yes. different, absolutely. Everybody's got their own retirement needs, their own uh, their own health issues, their, their own longevity risk. And we, right. hope, we hope you've got lots of longevity risk. <laughs> yes. but, um, it, but it absolutely is sort of very much an individual thing, but you just need to start with a plan. Absolutely. So listen, thank you so much for your insights. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. On our next episode of Insights Now, I'll be joined by Beth Nardi to discuss the ways model portfolios are revolutionizing the ways financial professionals manage investments. To all our viewers and listeners, thank you for tuning in today and speak with you soon.